So in our last session we focused on children aged 18 and below and we uh, continued to go through um, the list of questions that we have behind us um, that we set out at the beginning of these sessions and we found research that provided answers to each one of those and we also looked at some quotes from the Bible that applied to each one of those as well. We looked at studies that showed how technology does affect our children's sleep patterns, brain development, body weight and academic performance, how it can create difficult family environments and challenging behaviours from children um, who cannot self-regulate or control themselves, how it can create feelings of anxiety and stress, depression or lead to suicidal outcomes or uh, feelings if we're not aware of those dangers. We also saw how regardless of the content on these devices, the amount of viewing time does matter. We also alluded to a number of times the positive role that parents can play in helping their children through this ever-changing landscape and also the responsibility that has to be carried by the teenagers themselves in making those decisions. But we know that all of these things that we've looked at already can also be applied to adults and therefore should be approached uh, with caution for those that are older as well. Now this evening we've added two extra questions um, and they are can you be bullied online and is it affecting my general life enjoyment? And we'll look at a few studies in relation to those. But we'll be focusing for tonight on those aged 19 and above, which are young adults, adults, parents or the elderly, examining how technology is affecting our relationships with each other, our social situations, life enjoyment, parenting, stress, feelings of loneliness and creating a new medical epidemic which is called digital dementia. Now we're going to go uh, looking through what God expects of us as young adults, parents and elderly and to finish with some practical examples of ways that we can manage usage with these devices day to day. Because as said many times, these talks are not about removing these devices or um, going completely technology free. It's about managing your usage, not being managed by it. So, can you be bullied online? Well, as we well know, it's not just screen time that we should be concerned about. It's also the content that's on those devices and what they can give us access to. And some content can be quite damaging to people's state of mind and well-being. Now, cyberbullying has only been around really since the invention of social media, so that's in the last 15 years. And it's something that affects many demographics, not just teenagers, which is why we're considering it tonight. So what is cyberbullying? Well, a study in 2012 titled Bullying and Cyberbullying from Elon University had this to say. Unlike traditional bullying, cyberbullying allows the offender to mask his or her identity behind a computer. This anonymity makes it easier for the offender to strike blows against a victim without having to see the victim's physical response. The distancing effect that technological devices have on today's youth often leads them to say and do crueler things compared to what is typical in a traditional face-to-face -face bullying situation. So this perfectly links back to what we saw last week, how when we browse the internet, the parts of our brain that control empathy show no sign of activity. And furthermore, there is a corresponding 40% drop in empathy among today's university students when compared to those from the 70s and 80s. So we saw that last week and it perfectly correlates um, with this um, in terms of people don't have to see the effects of the hurtful words that they are saying to people. In 2007, in the USA, a study titled Bullying, Cyberbullying and Suicide used a random sample of nearly 2,000 middle schoolers to complete a survey of internet use and experiences. And this is what they found. Cyberbullying victimisation rates have varied in the past few years, ranging between 18.8% .8 in 2007 and 28.7% in 2009, based on seven different studies. Another important factor is what type of technology a teen primarily uses. We asked teens what role technology played in their daily lives and cell phones were used 
the most, 83%, followed by internet for schoolwork at 50.8% and then very closely followed Facebook at 50.1%. Now this points to cell phones and internet as the two primary mediums used for cyberbullying. And I just read an article today, which we're going to consider in a moment, which actually said that in, in 2019 it's actually closer to 50% of um, teens and middle schoolers that are actually subject to uh, cyberbullying at some point in time during their school education. So staggering numbers, 50% these days. Now this instantly tells us that if we want to dramatically reduce the amount of cyberbullying on our children and what they might experience, according from the data here, we see that a good place to start is limiting screen time and phone usage or not, good, not giving school-aged children a smartphone. Now, does anyone know what this term is used to describe these days? Thank you. So it's basically, yes, like you say, it's luring someone in under false pretenses. So catfish is a term to describe people who take on fake personas online and then target people to make them believe they're real so that they can exploit them. Now, here is a recent example in Melbourne. Now, Emma, who works as a flight attendant, was contacted by an old school friend, Lincoln Lewis, who, as many of you would know, being avid Home and Away fans, would realise he starred on the Home and Away show for many, many years. Now, this is a real example, but Emma is a made-up name, uh, according to the article I've got this from. So Emma has just come out of a messy relationship and she was glad to confide in someone like Lincoln that she actually knew quite well in school. What started off as a few casual messages became more intimate and they Skyped rarely and when they did, Lincoln was always in a bit of a dimly lit room and hard to see. But after months of talking online, having never met face to face, Emma was convinced they were in a relationship and she told her friends. Now one of her friends said it sounded like she was being scammed and bringing this up with her now boyfriend Lincoln she found that it wasn't actually Lincoln, it was someone pretending to be him, so they admitted it. But regardless of this, for some reason, Emma wanted to continue this relationship, but things got really nasty. She started receiving phone calls from people saying that they were going to kill the real Lincoln and hurtful comments from random people on Facebook saying hurtful comments like um, that, that, that she should kill herself and that no one's going to support her with her depression. After this, um, Emma got the police involved and she ended the relationship in 2016. In 2018, she actually committed suicide. So it eventually came out that the person behind all this was a Melbourne-based 29-year-old mother of two and wife called Lydia Abdel-Malek. Now, she had pretended to be Lincoln Lewis and numerous other aliases to six people uh, over the past four years. She was the one calling with the death threats. She was the one sending hurtful comments from multiple made-up aliases that she was controlling. And a judge decided on the 7th of June 2019 that Lydia was in part responsible for Emma committing suicide, sentencing her to two and a half years in jail, from which she was just released on bail. But does she look like someone capable of doing that? No, she just looks like an ordinary person living an ordinary life. <coughs> Did it seem like Emma was being scammed at the beginning? Well, not really, because she had a connection with him back in her past, so it kind of seemed plausible. Maybe she should have paid more attention to the warning signs, but it kind of all seemed quite plausible. Now, there are many other examples out there. This is just one of teenagers making friends online and then meeting them for the first time only to then be abducted by an older person who was pretending to be a schoolgirl or boy. But this example was a flight attendant, so she was in her mid-twenties. So it can affect both demographics, older or younger. So the online world, with all its benefits, is somewhere where children and adults can be affected and we should all be cautious. Now, the Bible has this to say about putting ourselves in bad situations. Now, the whole chapter, it's a fantastic chapter, but the whole chapter is about the importance of writing God's ways into our hearts and lives. 
It then gives an example of a young man wandering into parts of a city where a prostitute is. It's a parable about those that are not vigilant of the dangers and seduction of the world and the gradual mistakes they make to an inevitable decision. And this is one part of that story. At the window of my house, I have looked out through my lattice and I have seen among the simple, I have perceived among the youths, a young man lacking sense, passing along the street near her corner, taking the road to her house in the twilight, in the evening, at the time of night and darkness. So this young person has put themselves in a dangerous situation, hasn't he? He's walking around in the middle of the night in parts of the city that are known to be a bit dodgy and the story goes on to say that when he was caught by this prostitute that with the flattery of her lips he was like putty in her hands. Now, this was something that it tells us that he didn't go seeking to do but because of his lack of vigilance he ended up in a bad situation that made making the right choice virtually impossible. Now we can see from things online that we must also approach these with caution for all ages. We must all be vigilant and aware of the potential dangers. Now clearly our mental state can be affected by similar catfish examples as we've seen uh, or cyberbullying in general. Now you might be thinking, well if there's so much evidence about these things and about phones and about the dangers and all of this sort of stuff and in our last talk we spoke about academic performance, how it was slipping. Why aren't schools doing anything about it? Well, an article published yesterday in The Age titled Mobile Phones to be Banned in State Primary and Secondary Schools talks about this exact issue. It highlights how the Victorian Government has now banned mobile phones to be used at school from prep to year 12 with the exception that students can only use it um, for classroom activities. They're not allowed to take it really out of their bag until the end of school. Um, and there's a funny little comic here that I thought was quite funny, where in the back in the day it used to be hiding uh, behind the sheds smoking, um, and now it's hiding behind the sheds playing games on your phone. So I thought that was quite funny. But um, we can see that this is a really positive step forward. Now, for the kids, you might not think it's that great, but really, it is actually the best thing that we, we could be doing because it provides a lot more credibility as well to what we've been talking about over the last three weeks. And it gives you a bit more confidence that this bearded guy up here knows a little bit about what he's talking about. So, in summary for this section, can you be bullied online? Well, we know that this is something that affects young and old and everyone needs to be vigilant and aware of the dangers. But is it affecting my ability to be a good parent or to parent in general? <clears throat> it is well known that children will to a large extent follow the behavioural patterns that their parents lay down for them throughout their childhood. And the Bible gives us very cl clear, sound wisdom when it comes to the importance that it places on the influence parents can have on their children. Deuteronomy says this, You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes, you shall teach my ways diligently to your children. You shall talk with them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Now this commandment from God tells us that we not only need to teach our children about him, but we need to be an example of him in life to show that example to our children and teach and instruct them God's ways so that it will be a lasting impression that to some extent might define who they are and who they become. Now, however, this training can be either positive or negative. The wisdom for us here is to never underestimate how much our children observe and repeat our behaviour. 
Now, a study conducted in 2019 in the UK surveyed over 2,000 parents and analysed how children who came from higher socioeconomic status homes were more likely to use technology on a daily basis, and this is what they found. Parents of higher socioeconomic status or education are more digitally advantaged. People, uh, parents with higher levels of education use a wider range of devices to go online, especially more smart devices. Echoing the behaviour of the parents, children from high socioeconomic status families use the internet more often and on a wider range of devices. So the cl clear message here that we can see is that what we might see as being a fairly meaningless task, like checking our phone or being on our computer around our children, our children actually observe that from a very young age and, as it states here, will start to repeat and copy that behaviour. And the same goes for teenagers. I mean, really, how can we expect our young children or teenagers to get off their phone or stop watching TV or stop looking at a phone when you're talking to them when... Maybe they've just learnt that from us. The study goes on to show how 40% of parents download or stream videos or apps or games for their children. Now that might seem harmless, but as we saw last week, something we should, it's something we should be trying to avoid because just nine minutes of viewing for children under the age of four begins to suppress the development of the frontal lobes, which we know is uh, responsible for core life skills such as goal-directed behaviour, attention, working memory, inhibitory control, problem-solving, self-regulation and delay of gratification. And what you'll notice is that a lot of the things that you'll hear are things that we've actually already heard before, but the interesting thing is that they've all been from different studies, which gives us a lot of confidence in these results because they're coming from independent sources all over the place, but with the same message. So a study in the USA in 2018 investigated if there was a correlation between child externalising behaviour, in other words, tantrums and yelling, and parent smartphone use. And this is what they found. Overall, like most developmental processes, these results support the hypothesis that relationships between parent technoconference, that's going into their phone in the middle of a child-parent interaction. So going uh, between parent technoconference and child externalising behaviour are transactional and influence each other over time. In other words, parents who have children with more externalising problems become more stressed, which leads them to go to their phones more. Now, to put that in a diagram, this is basically what it's talking about. Parents are on their device distracted from their child for whatever reason. The child becomes frustrated and externalises their behaviour. They get annoyed that they can't get their mum or dad's attention. So they start throwing a bit of a tantrum. This actually increases the parent's stress. Now maybe you've felt this before. I know I definitely have. This just increases the stress levels in the room because you want to do something but they're not letting you do that thing. It's so frustrating. But parents then, as a result of this increased stress, the study goes on to say that they actually escape to their smartphones because they see that as a source of de-stressing. But what happens is the opposite effect. It actually makes the child more frustrated, which leads to more tantrums, creating greater parent stress, and they go into their devices to de-stress. And then you wake up, and the day goes on, and it continues. Now, I'm sure all of us have experienced that. I have definitely experienced that. But... One of the dangers is when the children actually stop coming to you. So what can happen is a child will only come to its parent so many times and then they'll give up and go do something else. And that might take a long time, but in the end, what will happen is the study goes on to say that what they also observed as a part of this cycle is that there was also an offshoot of um, attitudes of what the children did. So at about this point, instead of going back to the mum or dad, they'd actually start internalising their behaviour. So they'd just be getting really angry and frustrated and upset inside. They'd then be antisocial and withdraw, and then they'd basically have their own little independence, and they would go to the device for seeking gratification and support. Now, that 
that is, uh, you know, it doesn't take long to realise that that's a pretty tragic uh, scene. But the study goes on to say this. Another less immediate mechanism is that when mobile device use displaces verbal and non-verbal interaction and responsiveness over time, it is possible that children receive less parent scaffolding, the parent's ability to give the child just enough positive support to perform a new skill on their own. However, parents who frequently use their mobile devices during parent-child activities show lower understanding of their child's mental state and intentions. Now, if we as parents are not fully invested in the child in the moment, but instead constantly distracted by our phones going back and forth between the two, which I've done before and I'm sure all of you have done before as well, we're not giving the child the vital support they need and encouragement they need to develop. The study goes on to say that children who have parents that frequently do this stop asking their parents for help and support and they replace it with the gratification they receive from their devices. And what a tragic outcome that is. Now, what, parents, now what parent wants their child to not come to them for support? What parent wants that? I don't think there'd be a single parent that wouldn't want that. But that's exactly what we might be unintentionally doing by not being aware of how we're using our devices in our family environment. Now, the Bible goes on to provide some encouraging words for us in the Proverbs. Discipline your children and they will give you peace. They will bring you the delights you desire. But parents also need to discipline themselves. As parents, we cannot create unrealistic rules or expectations or be hypocritical. We have to be consistent, which is hard. And the older children get, the more they observe and the more those things apply. But parents need to use that short window that they have when their kids are young to maximise the amount of potential, uh, the amount of positive influence that we can have on them. And the Bible tells us that they will be the delights that you desire. So it's a very positive thing that God tells us and he gives us courage to do those things even though they might be stepping outside our comfort zone. Now parents are not there to make decisions for their kids throughout their entire life. There is a small window where they can but ultimately the role of a parent is to educate the kids on how to make the right decisions when the parents aren't there. So it's not necessarily about removing devices or limiting device usage, it's also about explaining why to the kids. And that becomes why will become a bigger question the older that they get. So is it affecting my ability to parent? Well, we've seen how that our example as parents is crucial. That neglecting our kids for devices makes kids more frustrated and in turn parents more stressed and that God encourages us as parents to discipline ourselves and our kids for the better. But what about reading on paper versus reading on um, a digital device, something that's very common these days? Is there a difference between these two? If the answer was no, I'm sure you'd be quite surprised and we just move straight on to the next question. But yes, there is. There is a difference, believe it or not. So, using tablets, Kindles and smartphones to replace physical books has been a booming industry over the past 10 years and Bibles haven't escaped from this with more and more people trading in their physical Bibles for digital ones. Now, obviously, there are great benefits for this because it means that we can carry an unlimited amount of books with us wherever we go. But are there any drawbacks in relation to comprehension, spatial memory and retention? Well, that's exactly what the following studies set out to answer. So a study in 2013 titled Reading Linear Texts on Paper versus Computer Screens, it's pretty what we're talking about, states this, Subjects who read texts on paper performed significantly better than subjects who read texts on computer screens. Difficulties in reading from computers may be due to the disrupted mental maps of the text, which may be reflected in poor understanding and poor recollection 
of the material. Now, a similar study in 1997 titled Effects of Screen Presentation on Text Reading and Revising had this to say. This is the second one. Another was the navigation issues with not being able to have access to the text in its entirety. Evidence suggests that readers often recall where a, where a text where text is on a particular or a particular piece of information appeared. Now we've all done that, haven't we? we? Where we have a physical book and we, like let's say it's the Bible, and we don't know the exact verse or chapter, but we know it was roughly in the bottom right or it was roughly in, in this column somewhere over here and we sort of flick through the pages until we find the area that we um, uh, are trying to find. And what our brain is doing when we read physical books is that our brain's actually creating a mental map of the physical text. Now, the last study, titled Spatial Coding and Discourse Models During Text Reading, said this. We know from, from empirical and theoretical research that having a good spatial mental representation of the physical layout of the text supports reading comprehension. So why is this significant? Because when it comes to reading the Bible or any book, if we want to make the most out of what we're reading and develop a deep comprehension of it, then a physical book, based on these studies, is the way to go. Because it will help to structure our memory based off its physical parameters. Now, it may not always be practical to have physical books, and this is totally a personal choice. But the main message here that we wanted to answer, the main question was, is there a difference in terms of comprehension? And as we can see, there is a slight difference in terms of how much we remember and retain reading it on a tablet versus reading it from a physical book. But it is a physical, uh, sorry, it is, a, it is totally a personal choice. So is there a difference? Well, we've seen reading from a physical books help to create mental maps that assist with structuring information in our brain which increases our comprehension and retention ability. Digital does not do that. So what about general life enjoyment? Is it affecting, uh, are smart devices affecting my general life enjoyment? Well, as technology has become smarter, cheaper, lighter, faster and more portable, so is our adoption of it. As we saw in the first talk, there's a whole host of things that we now have access to on our devices. But as we have all experienced, it's well and truly become part of our social gatherings, our family time, even our one-on-one -on -one discussions. I have a friend at work that if you lose his concentration for three seconds, he'll pull out his phone. Maybe you know people that are like that. He actually asks me a question and then in three seconds he'll pull out his phone and start looking at his phone and I just actually stopped talking for a good amount of time and he goes, yeah, go on, go on. So, you know, it's just something that, that happens these days but um, maybe you've had that same sort of experience. So, um, but what underlying psychological effect does this have on us? A study in Canada in 2007 wanted to understand whether smartphone use might undermine the enjoyment that people derive from real-world social interactions. They got 300 participants um, and they were asked to share a meal at a restaurant with friends or family. They could choose and it had to just be one or more people. Participants were randomly assigned to check their phones regularly or put their phones away during the meal. So um, it was sort of split half-half. And this is what they found. As predicted, during episodes that included face-to-face -face social interactions, people reported feeling more distracted when they used their smartphones than when they did not, less interest and enjoyment when they used their smartphones than when they did not, and people reported worse effect, less socially connected, more bored and perceived time to be moving slower. Now, maybe you've experienced some of those feelings as well. Um, I know I certainly have, but it goes on to say this. Of course, everyday life is riddled with other sources of distraction such as newspapers and television. But phones differ from these earlier forms of information technology in a critical way. 
Phones provide access to virtually an infinite array of potential diversions while being so portable that they are always with us, enabling them to, evade, to easily pervade our social interactions. Now, we saw from our first session that 79% of smartphone owners aged between 18 and 44 keep their phones within two metres of them for 22 hours of the day. So that's 79% of most of us. Now, the research concludes by saying this. This research suggests that despite their ability to connect with others across the globe, phones may undermine the benefits we derive from interacting with those across the table. Now, I think this is such a very true statement and it lines up perfectly with what we've seen in our first and second talk, where fobbing is now a socially acceptable behaviour conducted by 90% of cell phone owners. That's when you um, ignore someone face to face for a message on your phone. Now, we're all obsessed with keeping in contact with people, aren't we? At, at the expense of people right in front of us. And we do it all the time. And then we're unsure why we might feel less connected, bored or even depressed. That's what this study highlights. Now, the Bible has very clear, sound advice when it comes to how we should uh, approach this or, or live day to day. It says, Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, this is obviously talking about not worrying about future things, things out of our control and letting them consume us. But the same can be applied in this context. Are our devices causing us unnecessary worry or distraction from the things that are right in front of us? Undoubtedly, yes. But the Bible tells us to concentrate on things in the present. Now, if you have family overseas or friends that you keep in contact with that you rarely see, that is totally fine. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that. But we need to put boundaries around that um, and when, about when we use our phone so that we ensure that one does not come at the expense of the other. So is it affecting general life enjoyment? Well, we saw from one study how smartphones can distract us from meaningful relationships right in front of us that can lead to us feeling socially disconnected. But can it cause early onset dementia? Our brains are like a muscle and like muscles the rule is usually use it or lose it. Now dementia is a debilitating disease that affects uh, an estimated 47 million people globally back in 2017. But researchers at the World Health Organization are predicting that number to rise to 82 million by 2030, so basically doubling. But offloading our memory to our devices um, does affect our ability to remember in general. We've all got calculators on our phones that we carry around with us everywhere we go. Um, so before we dive into this further, let's just consider what dementia actually is. So according to a study by the Mental Health Foundation in 2011, um, they explain the effects of dementia as follows. When someone is suffering from dementia, it is because brain cells have now become damaged and started to die. Once these brain cells are dead, those cells cannot grow again. This brings out severe memory loss and many other warning signs. Now, leading brain uh, researcher Gerald uh, Huffer states that our brain development is related to our life experiences. He says this, the more unfinished the brain uh, still is at the time of birth and the slower it develops during the following period and the longer it takes for its neurological connections to be definitively worked out and established, the greater and richer the opportunities are for the individual's own experiences and the conditions it encounters in its own life to become anchored in the matrix of its brain. Now, what that is basically saying is that our brain takes time to develop. But the longer that process takes, the higher the risk of it not developing beyond its current context. 
Now we've already considered how the frontal lobe development in children is affected by the amount of screen time that they consume. And this study here reaffirms that the longer we let that happen, the more likely their brain is to be anchored in its matrix. And under a microscope, um, these are some images I pulled out of the same study. Uh, the left image being um, tissue of an Alzheimer's disease patient compared with a healthy brain cell. As you can see, it started to fragment. Um, and on the right image, a healthy brain compared to an Alzheimer's disease patient's brain. As you can see, the, the brain is actually beginning to shrink and deteriorate. But how is offloading our memory to our devices um, affecting our ability to remember in, in general? A study in the Czech Republic in 2018 examined whether prolonged GPS usage could affect the hippocampal function. Now, the hippocampus is an organ in the brain that is mainly associated with memory, in particular long-term memory, spatial memory, and plays an important role um, in spatial navigation. And this is what they found. These preliminary observations support the assumption that externalisation of some mental capacity to technological devices has measurable neurobiological consequences in the hippocampus. So another study from the University of Gothenburg in 2010 looked specifically at the correlation between dementia and hippocampus function and their conclusion was this. Um, their conclusion was this. Our findings suggest that the size of the hippocampus is linked to a deterioration in cognitive function and dementia. Now, why is this relevant? Because in these two examples, we've been able to show that entrusting information and memory to devices has neurobiological consequences in the hippocampus organ the health of that organ being a determinant factor in early onset dementia. But who would have thought that entrusting numbers or mathematical sums or trivial things to our devices um, or directions such as the GPS study would have such an effect? Um, Byun Gi Won, a doctor at the Balanced Brain Centre in Seoul, said this, the overuse of smartphones and game devices hampers balanced brain development. Um, heavy users are likely to develop the left side of their brain, leaving the right side untapped. Um, Nicholas Carr, who was a, who was a renowned, uh, renowned on studying technology and culture, in his writings, he described um, his negative experience with the internet as follows. And I can definitely relate to this. I don't know about you. But we ask the internet to keep interrupting us in more and more different ways, we willingly accept the loss of concentration and focus and the division of our attention and fragmentation of our thoughts in return for the wealth of compelling or at least diverting information we receive. Excessive use of digital technology and outsourcing their mental activity would damage the brain and cause temporary memory loss among teenagers and youngsters. The addiction to smartphones among the groups has negative effects on the part of the brain that regulates memory, concentration and attention span. Now the parts of the brain he's referring to are all parts that we've already looked at, that being the hippocampus organ and the frontal lobes which we, we, we discussed um, research pointing to the same conclusions last week. So according to research in 2015 titled Living with Technology, an investigation into young adults' challenge to prevent digital dementia, they discovered that these are the common traits for people suffering from early onset digital dementia. And have a read of that list. Difficulty to focus and concentrate, weaker memory, spending upwards of seven hours a day on a device, stunted social skills, FOMO, shortened attention span and emotional reactions to not having their phone. Now for me, I know that I could have ticked three or four of those seven. Now honestly, think about this, how many could you tick? Have a think about it, how many of those could you tick? Now if you could tick as many as I could, 
then that is an indication that maybe some things need to change. If we do struggle with a range of those, and I'm sure most of you do, it makes doing this very difficult. I will meditate on your precepts. I will fix my eyes on your ways. I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Now within that quote from the Psalms, God emphasises the importance of meditation, concentration, retention and effect. Now how can we expect to be any good at doing those things or the generation coming up if our attention span is short, if we are constantly distracted, our ability to retain information is weak. For Jesus' example to move us to change our life, it requires us to have all of those things, doesn't it? every single one of them. So can it cause early onset dementia? Now we only looked at a few studies. There are so many out there and I had heaps more I could have put in but obviously we don't have the time for that. But we've seen how dementia is a debilitating disease that affects millions of people globally and is set to double in the next 10 years. We've seen that one um, of the common indicators of early onset dementia is the size of the organ in the brain called the hippocampus. We saw how that we can alter the size of that organ by offloading even seemingly insignificant information from our brain to our devices, but that it has a lasting effect. We also saw the common traits that we can exhibit and we lastly saw how God emphasises the importance of meditation, concentration, retention and effect. But what proactive things can I do? Now we've spent a lot of the time in our studies looking at the effects, which has been good, because what that all feeds into are the practical things that we can actually do to counteract those. So, what can we do that's practical? So, let's focus on uh, parents to, to start with and then we'll move on to everyone. So, based on the evidence from the research that we've considered, these are some recommendations. These aren't just things I've just made up. It's all based off what we've spoken about. First and foremost, parents need to set the example in their life. They need to set the example around creating rules and usage starting with themselves. That is first and foremost. It's not just about saying no, but more about explaining why. And as we have already said, the why question becomes more and more prevalent the older the kids get. Don't be afraid to start implementing rules in your family. That's the right God has given you as a parent. Now, <clears throat> if we've let some of these things happen, I'm sure a lot of us have, maybe all of us have, it can be scary to then approach that with changing things up in our family life because we've now set an expectation, we're now removing that privilege from them potentially. But God tells us that that's your right as a parent to be able to do that. And he provides encouraging advice to us, as we saw before, that they will give us the things that we desire. They will be a, um, a blessing to us. Responsibility as well. Yep. Yep, definitely. No, good point. Thank you, Uncle Peter. Um, the, the fourth one in that, in that column... Give your child your full attention. Don't go between child and phone. But, you know, if you do have to use your phone or laptop, just explain to the child that you have to do this. It'll be five minutes or whatever it is. Time box it. Give them a time frame and say, then I will be with you. But right now I am doing this. Now, you know, this is an idealistic way of looking at it. I've tried this with Lior many times. It, it does work and sometimes it doesn't work because he's just throwing a tantrum. But it is consistency from us, isn't it? It's consistency um, and our example that will be the lasting effect and that will win out. And based on the research that we saw, the ideal screen time limits are from zero to three, no hours a day. From three to 12, half an hour to an hour a day and from 12 to 18 years, one hour a day. Now this is all leisure time. If they had to do things on computers for schoolwork, that's slightly different. This is leisure time, screen time. 
one more thing for parents and that is this. Now when approaching the subject of when is the right time to give your child a phone or when these conversations come up, there are a few steps that we should take um, and, and these are the steps here from the most desirable to the least desirable. So the most desirable is that we don't give our kids phones for as long as we can until they're at least at school or 18 years of age. But if that's not possible, then the second one is the next option that we should take. Have a family phone that's shared amongst the kids. You know, it's not their phone. Don't let them think it's their phone. It's the family's phone. Maybe you need two between all the kids or whatever it is. But have a family phone. Especially when kids start getting into relationships, it can help to mitigate potentially inappropriate content. The third one, if that's, if that's not a, you know, a viable option, the third one is probably the next best, and that is give them a dumb phone. They don't need smartphones. What other things at this stage in their life do they need than being able to talk or text and being able to communicate with mum and dad? I cannot think of a reason why um, a child needs YouTube and Facebook and all these other things uh, during the most influential part of their life. So give them a dumb phone. But if that is not possible, then, and you have to give them a smart device, give it to them, but set parental controls. So I don't know about Android, but I know Apple have fantastic parental control um, controls on their phone. Um, and it's, I actually lost my phone, my dumb phone, which I've been using for nine months, and I had to replace it with a smartphone, which I dumbed down with parental controls. <laughs> But anyway, um, that is, you know, the fourth option that we have. But one that should just never even be an option for us, ever, is giving our kids under 18 a smart device with unrestricted access. That is just um, a, a crazy thing that we could think of doing in, in this world uh, today. Um, depending on your relationship with your kid, you, you might have a level of trust with them where you're you're, you're giving this to them and there's sort of an understanding there that they have to use it responsibly. Use it um, or, or meet this out appropriately in your family life as you will. But according to the research, uh, these would be the steps that we should think of taking. <clears throat> now, something that everyone can take on board. Try not taking your phone everywhere with you. We saw that 90% of us uh, or 80% of us between uh, 18 and 44 have it with us within two metres of us 22 hours of the day. So let's just try putting it somewhere else. Let's just try doing that. When you're talking to someone, try not to pull it out of your pocket. Just give that a go. For one day, just give that a go. Try not to pull it out of your pocket when you're talking to someone. Now, if you are meeting with someone, put your phone in your pocket or in your bag and put it on flight mode, because that's the main thing. It's a notification or, or, or the buzzing sensation inside your pocket that makes you want to check it. So if you turn it on flight mode, that won't happen, and you can enjoy that face-to-face -face interaction. Have a place in the house where phones are kept and try and only use them in that area. So again, it's thinking about um, how can we sort of limit the amount of time that they're actually on us all the time. Teenagers need to take responsibility for their own screen time. As we've seen, parents can only influence this for so long, but it's about educating them on making the right decisions and they need to start creating their own good habits. Now, something I did straight away on my new dumb phone here is you turn off all notifications and badges. So that's anything in relation to texting or anything that's not a phone call I basically turned them all off <clears throat> and it's amazing how much extra work you can get done without all these WhatsApp or beeping messages coming um, onto your phone. If you want, you can put your phone on low battery mode. There's great benefits to that because it increases your battery life by about 50% and we all struggle for battery life and it also stops pulling information into your phone whenever it wants. Instead, when you open the app, then it will pull the information. So it again, stops you constantly getting bombarded with things. Take advantage of the app usage software in iOS and set up daily time frame restrictions for certain apps. So if you know that you use your phone mo mostly for emails, 
and that you kind of don't really work a nine to five job anymore and you use your emails a lot at home and you kind of see that as a problem, well then here's a good place to start because it allows you to set time frame restrictions for certain apps. So if emails are your problem at home, you can set a restriction to five o'clock and then you can't access that app until the next morning. Now, these are all things that um, you, you can do and I've done on this phone, I was gonna show you but we've run out of time, that's okay. Um, and if you're not convinced about anything we've um, spoken about, do your own research, of course. Um, but if you still don't feel like you can control your usage, even dumbing down everything on your phone like this, you know, you can always sort of figure out a way to get around it when you really want, when you really want things, then just get a dumb phone. I've had one for 10 months and it's really, really good. And, um, you know, not everyone has to get it, but for me, I couldn't control the usage that I was doing on, on these phones. So that was one way that I had to deal with it in my life. But you might be slightly different. <coughs> All right. So now there's no way that you've remembered everything we've spoken about over the last three weeks. So if you would like a copy of the booklet, which I've done or is almost finished, um, give me your email afterwards and I'll send it to you because it ends up being about 50, 60 pages and I'm not going to print out that amount of pages at work. That's going to get me fired. <laughs> so, you know, that, that's a lot of pages. But, you know, um, I can give you a digital copy and you can read that or print it out if you really want to comprehend it quite well. Print it out and then flick through it. But I composed these talks because I thought that there must be more people out there thinking about questions like this that it wasn't just myself. And I wanted to make an informed decision as a parent in my own personal life as well about what I could do that would help my family. Um, and I wanted to share that with as many people as I could so that they could have that same opportunity. Over these three talks, we've looked at over 50 research articles from different, um, from different research articles over different time spans and from different parts of the world, answering the list of questions that we have here one by one. And there are so many more that we have, but we, we just can't go through it all. But more importantly, we've seen how many of these independent studies all point towards the same conclusions, which gives us great confidence in their findings. We've also seen the expectation from God to those who are parents, adults or teenagers and the responsibilities we have to each other. Now these talks have not been a judgement on life choices or parenting styles. They were designed to inform you as parents, adults and young people of the evidence around what smart devices actually do so that you can take that information and apply that appropriately to how you run your personal life or family life. Yes, these devices are amazing. They give us access to so many things, anytime, anywhere, but we have to deeply consider and evaluate our lives, asking the key question, at what cost? Now, I want to finish off with a quote from the book of Titus, which I think sums up our thoughts nicely around responsibility, control, and spiritual mindedness. The grace of God teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, instead to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age.